phase. My guest this morning is Carla M. Cherry. She is an English teacher and multi-title author, poet, and owner of Sweet as a Simile LLC, a specialty apparel company. A VONA 2020 Voices of Our Nations and NYC Poet. A float 2024 alum, she holds degrees from Spelman College, New York University, and Lehman College, and an MFA in creative writing poetry from the City College of New York. Committed to social change, she is a vegan and donates to worthy causes. In her spare time, she studies Chicago-style stepping and dances at every set she can make. Carla performs her poetry and vends her books and apparel throughout the tri-state area. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Reading Circle Microphones, Carla M. Cherry. Carla, good morning. Good morning, Mark. How are you? I am well, thanks, and so glad that we had this opportunity to chat this morning. Listening on, as you know, last week I had Eartha Watts Hicks on the show, and I told you my experience with Eartha last week in terms of us meeting up at the Harlem Book Fair. And Carla is one of the authors that Eartha introduced me to. And so when I threw out the invitation, Carla responded, just as Eartha did and, and so many others that I had the opportunity to meet that day. So I am thankful for that, for the time that we met and that she took the invitation and she's now here this morning with me. So again, Carla, good morning to you. Thank you so much. So I'll tell you what, like I said a couple of minutes ago, I generally don't have, you know, a, a set question list, but I do kind of start so I can walk the listening audience through your journey. So I see you're an English teacher. We're kindred spirits. I taught ELA eighth grade. Whenever I was teaching, I was an ELA teacher. I had eighth graders. So talk to me a little bit about where did the love of English come from, the writing, poetry? Is that something, again, I kind of start with, was that something that started in elementary school, high school, later in life? Kind of where did it begin? Well, my love of reading began when I was about two years old. My mother uh, took the initiative to teach me how to read when I was two. And my love of reading began there. And when I was in second grade, I had a wonderful English teacher, Mrs. Pine, who introduced me to poetry. And she gave me a diary by the end of the school year and really encouraged me to write. And so um, I would write poetry every now and then as I was growing up uh, through college. But it wasn't until my, my father passed away in 2005 that I really took my uh, poetry journey more seriously. I was looking for a way to um, process my grief over my father, and poetry provided me not only a space to process his, his passing, but it also gave me a way to express myself and make myself feel good. You know, it's interesting how writing can do that. I mean, this is my 23rd year on the air, and I cannot tell you how many authors I've had on that shared something similar in terms of the catharsisism or it being cathartic or being able to release by putting it down on paper. And so yeah. to, to hear that, um, I, I am not surprised at that. At all. And it's also fascinating to hear that it started with a teacher in terms of constant encouragement because my day job is being a principal and I'm constantly trying to help my teachers understand that one or two words from you could set the path for a child positively or negatively. So when a child, you know, when someone says, you know what, you're really good at that. We never know where that's going to take that child. And at the same time, if someone says, you know what, you are constantly uh, disencouraging him or, you know, not encouraging him or always being negative. We never know where that's going to take the child either. And I also heard you said your, your mom was encouraging reading and that you started at two. Like, wow. Yes. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's interesting. My mother also had a great love of literature. And um, she was, you know, really smart in school. Um, she could have been skipped a grade, but wasn't. And I think a lot of that had to do with racism. Um, my mother wanted to go to college, and she was discouraged from doing that. She wanted to become... Um, she wanted to go into business administration and was looking forward to going to college, and she was discouraged by her high school guidance counselor who told her that business administration was not open to Negroes. And so my mother was really determined that her children would not only love literature, but they would um, 
have an opportunity to continue their education. So I really credit my mother for instilling a love of reading in, in both me and my sister. You know, again, I'm and I'm tying, I'm connecting some of the things that you're saying with things that we've heard from prior guests. A couple of weeks ago, I had a gentleman on, his name Dr. Josue Falez. He's from Haiti. And so the name is French, but he went on to say that when he was young, he wanted to be a veterinarian. And he was told that, just like your mom, that no one would support a black veterinarian. So when you just said that, I'm always amazed at just how many negative comments were and still are made about people of color. If you're black, if you're African-American, or if you're a person of color, it's amazing how this mindset of what you can't be. And people don't know you from Adam's house cat, but yet they look at the color of your skin and now make an assessment. Now, with that statement you just made, I, I always tell folks, you know, as, as a principal, I'm very clear with my staff, especially the guidance counselors and the school counselors. I said, if, if I ever hear of you telling a child that they're not college material, I'm going after your license because I'm not saying everybody has to go to college. We have to prepare them for options. In other words, it could be college. It could be military. It could be tech school. It could be trade school. It could be entrepreneurship, but all of them require education, but you cannot make an assessment of somebody and tell them what they can't be, especially based on the color of their skin or their ethnicity or their background or what have you. So every time I hear stories like that, I'm saddened. And at the same time, inspired and motivated because, like, when you tell me something like that, I can't do it. I'm going to make sure I do it. Absolutely. And we understand uh, white supremacy and, um, you know, one of his goals to make people believe that they can't fulfill their dreams. They want to keep us down. And so, you know, we've always had to fight against that and just find ways to display our brilliance. Absolutely right. Matter of fact, that's why I love the fact that as I've done this show and I've gotten people on the air over the years who talk about their love for reading and, and love for literature, and whatever, because there was a time, as you know, where if we were trying to even learn how to read, we could get killed and whoever was teaching us to learn how to read could get killed. And so I share that all the time, like all you have to do now is learn how to do it and you don't want to do that. And there was a time where we could lose our lives for wanting to learn how to read. Yeah. Well, that's why it's important that we share that history with our young people so they can understand the urgency that's behind literacy and um, education, making sure that our education is culturally relevant and that it's going to prepare us to succeed in the outside world as they emerge into adulthood. Absolutely. So are you still teaching? Because this is, is an English teacher. Are you still teaching or did are you doing something yes, different? Sir. This is year 29 for me. Oh, congratulations. God bless you. Yes. Uh, we, you. in terms of teaching, by all means, I think, you know, because people, I taught a class like a week ago Monday to 25 freshmen education majors. And I was having some fun with them in right. terms of them wanting to be teachers. But I also shared with them in terms of it is for me the greatest profession in the world. Because we have the opportunity to leave a legacy. Just like you just said, was it Mrs. Pines? Is that what you said? Yes, Mrs. Pines. All right, Mrs. Pine left a legacy. The fact that, that you can now refer to her now, however many years later, and the fact that you can refer to the fact that it was her encouragement, and along with your mother, uh, love of your mother's love of literature that got you where you are, that is saying something. That's why I love teaching. That's, that's what I, I mean. You, we just do not know the impact that we have on our students. Now, one day it might be somebody that said, because Miss Cherry said this, that's why I'm where I'm at. Or because of the encouragement of Miss Cherry. That's what I love about what we do. Me too. And that's always my hope that I'm able to leave at least some, some piece of knowledge that's going to help a young person succeed, whether it's how to write an essay or making them feel like they can write a poem and do it well. Um, they can speak their minds and, and learn something about their culture. That's my hope. Absolutely. In the early years of the show, it was actually on Friday mornings from 6 o'clock in the morning to 7.30. And I would leave here and I would go to my school where I was teaching language arts, English. Because I mean, when we, we were kids, we called it English, but now they call it ELA, mm -hmm. language arts, so forth and so on. But I would have my guests, a lot of times they would come live in the studio, and I would ask them, what are you doing after the show? 
And they were like, no, I'm going to go grab breakfast. This, that, and other. I said, do me a favor. Come with me to my school so I can introduce you to my students. And they, they would agree and say, okay. So I would bring them in and let the kids meet the author. And whenever the author would have their book, you know, in their hands, and then they would turn it around and they could see their picture on the back of the cover or what have you, the kids would lose their minds. I mean, oh, my God, that's you. That's your, you're, as, as, as a teacher, as well as a published author who has work out there, when you bring your work to your class, what is the response or the reaction? Well, it's interesting. Um I I really have not brought my books to my students very often. Um, part of it is because uh, some of the subject matter that I, I cover isn't always appropriate for the classroom. Okay. And so um, I haven't done it very often. I In my previous school, I taught a poetry course. And so um, in talking to the students about poetry, I would share my publishing experience and what my students asked me about my books and the students that I was working with at the time, they were a little older. I used to work in a transfer high school. Right. And so I did feel comfortable bringing my books to show one of my students. And she was just amazed by it. And, um, you know, she was looking through them and saying that she really liked my work. And that really made me feel good. And I just wanted her to know that you don't have to be someone who's famous in order to become an author. So I wanted her to know that authorship is accessible. Absolutely. So, yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe maybe I should rethink my position on that and, and share my, my work with my students more often. Well, it may not necessarily be the subject matter, but just the fact that they could see that you have a book out there but with your name in the byline. I mean, just the fact that they can see it, maybe you won't go into the, you know, the ins and outs of the nits and nats, or maybe you mm-hmm. will, depending on the age or, you know, if it's appropriate or not. But... Just right. the fact that they would know that their teacher is not only someone in the classroom talking about this stuff, but you actually do it. I mean, like, like of course, in, you know, in school, kids get books all the time. But it's another mm-hmm. thing to be able to say, I know that person whose name or picture is on that book. Yes. It, it is a powerful experience. It really is. That is, and it's funny you bring up the whole notion about famous or not, because this is the other thing about teaching. To me, and I, <laughs> to some of the things that I'm saying, the listening audience hear me say it all the time, depending on who I'm speaking with. <clears throat> but to me, teaching is, I always call it poor man's celebrity. In other words, we really are, we <laughs> teachers, we are famous, whether we know it or not, because <laughs> there is nowhere you can go that you don't want run into a student or either a parent. But the other thing, the funny part that always is really funny to me is when they see us doing things that normal people do, like shopping or in, you know, in the store or in the mall or whatever. I mean, they actually lose their minds when they see their teachers in these places. It's really funny how a lot of times students don't see us as, as full human beings. We're just the person <laughs> up there true. in front of them teaching a, a subject not realizing that, you know, we were students at one at one time and um, we have families and hopes and dreams and disappointments and frustrations. It's, it's always funny to me how students tend to view us, but, yeah, they need to see us as full human beings with, with outside interests and hopes and dreams and, and things that we need to work on and, and improve and, and, and we need to grow. So... Yeah, I, I think it's important that we share those kinds of things with students. And so maybe I will share my poems more often with them. And when I say they're not necessarily important for the classroom, I don't mean that they're pornographic or anything. It's, it's not like that. But, um, you know, I do tend to write about sexuality from time to time. And so, you know, certain things I don't want the students to see, but um, I do have a lot of poems that share um, things from my personal experience, um, poems that have to do with social justice, and I think it's important to share those things with them. Oh, certainly the social justice ones. I mean, if there ever was a time, because matter of fact, I'm I'm back in school again, and, and a part of the the major is social justice, is leadership and social justice. And so, by all means, we definitely need that. 
and and see again going back to what we were saying about the kids in terms of how they view they really do need to see us as human but it is really funny to me the reaction because I, I remember being in like either the Marshalls or Burlington or one of them and one of my students and their parents saw me and I mean they just could not believe oh my god that's Mr. Medley oh my god like yes we shop too we <laughs> we go food shopping too we go clothes shopping we yes we do that too but it is funny because a lot of times and, and now you teach ELA you teach English because I'm always kind of of the impression that really kids don't like to read they really don't want to read you almost have to force them to read but that's not necessarily true because there are students out there like i said whenever i had no idea they would respond to the the author guests that i had walking to the classroom the way that they did i thought they would be just kind of like eh that's a book so what big deal but uh uh-uh and it's the same way like when i walk into like a major bookstore like a barnes and nobles or whatever it's like whenever i see kids are in there and especially african-american families i am like Mm -hmm. thrilled Yes, yes. Yeah, and, and it's really important to um, expose students to authors wherever we can. Um, some years ago, I taught the book Undocumented by Dan L. Padilla Peralta, and he's a young man whose uh, parents uh, came to the United States from the Dominican Republic, and he shares the story of being an undocumented person and um, how he was able to go to private school because he was intellectually gifted, but he was always held back by his immigration status, and he wanted people to know what that experience was. And I had a number of students who were of Dominican background. And so my co-teacher at the time reached out to Daniel Padilla Peralta and invited him to uh, Skype with our students to talk about his, his book and experiences, and it was just an amazing experience. I'm sure it was because, see, again, a lot of times when we bring it, and that's that's another thing, like you said about exposure, and we bring this to life because that's another thing I love about teaching, that we get a chance to expose because we never know what kid that was singing and said, you know what, I'm going to be like him. You know what, I'm going to be like Miss Cherry. You know what, I'm going to write a book. We mm-hmm. just never know what trajectory we set a child on based on our you know behavior based on what we expose them to, so forth and so on. We never, and a lot of times they may not tell us until we run into them 10 or 15 or 20 years later or what have you. Um, I don't know if Miss Pine is still alive or not, but... She is. She is. I don't know, does she... Have you ever told her that it was because of her that you're doing what you do or partially oh, because of her? Absolutely, I have. Uh, we do talk from time to time, and um, she has several of my books, actually, and so she's well aware of the impact that she had on me as a child. I am still in touch with my second grade teacher. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, I am still in touch with Mrs. Royster. She's been ill lately. Matter of fact, I texted her the other day and asked her could she have visitors, and she can, but she told me she was busy that particular week, but she would be freer the next week, and so I got to get over to see her. But she actually came to my 50th birthday party, and that's going back like 12 years ago. That was my second grade teacher. So, yes, we, you know, there are other, I remember all my teachers. And so it is an important, like I said, career path, profession. And then when you now couple it with, because the other thing is sometimes people think we don't do anything else but teach. They're like, and mm-hmm. so now in your particular area, you own a business, you have Sweet as a simile. And when I first read that, I thought it said sweet as a smile. And I had to reread it again. I said, oh, lovely play on words. I love it. Because <laughs> I love a play on words. But sweet <laughs> as a simile. Oh, smile is like no sweet as simile. Because when I first read it, at first blush, that's what I was, oh, sweet. I was getting ready. Oh, no, that's sweet as a simile, LLC. A specialty apparel company. So you have a lot going on. You got the you got the apparel company going on. You got your books. You know, you do readings and you're teaching the class. All that to me, brings a really rich experience to the classroom. Well, it, it does. Um, and again, I haven't really talked to my students about um, my experience as a small business owner. Part of it is that I never want to be accused of, you know, using my position to promote myself. But um, yeah, it, it. I need to find a way to talk about my experience as an entrepreneur without coming off as, oh, you know, go out and buy myself. That's, that's not what I want them to do. I just want them to know, like, you know, that it is something that is attainable. Oh, it is definitely a way you can do that. I mean, you, you don't necessarily have to be promoting your business per se as, as you said, the fact that what an entrepreneur is, you know. Because, yes. see, this is the thing. For people who are, 
or who stay focused on just one thing throughout their entire lives. I'm not mad at them. I'm just, I'm not one of them. I'm kind of like you in terms of have done and doing multiple things um, because that's just kind of the way I am. I'm, I'm interested in many things. So the fact, though, it makes you, because you're a teacher, it makes you that much more, like I said, well-rounded and can offer that much more to your students than just somebody who does nothing else but teach. That's all they do. They don't do anything else but teach. But now the fact that you're an entrepreneur, you're an author, you get a chance to travel, you go around, and you're at different readings and, you know, festivals and, 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 you know, all these different things that are in your bio. Yeah, the kids, I mean, I mean this is me personally, your kids, need, they ought to know that. You're right. You're right. Okay, well, I'm, go- I'm going to uh, take a new approach with that when I go back <laughs> to work on Tuesday. And well, you've given I- me something to think about. No, I'm glad to hear that. But I mean, again, just from like, if you wa- first off, like if anybody walks in my office, they can read, they ought to be able to read me because everything is on my wall. As a matter of fact, my teachers tease me so much. They actually went out and bought me a sign that I just hanging on my door it says the Mark Medley Museum of Life Experiences. <laughs> That's what they, they went out. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> they, they actually gave me this. It was funny as heck. Because people would come and say, oh, my God, this is like a museum. You know, this is like, oh, my God, it's like a museum. And he was like, oh. So one of them took it upon themselves to buy the sign. It says the Mark Medley Museum of Life Experiences. And I got such a kick out of it. I said, you know, I'm going to put that right on the front. I'm putting that right on the door. And I so when people come in, that's what I could. It's like, no, this is not my office. This is the Mark Medley Museum of Life Experiences. However, I have fraternal experience. I have educational. I have corporate. I have religious. I have um, military. So all of that somewhere around the room on the walls is displayed. And at any given time, if a child is in my office, that can be used for teachable moments. Anything. So they know I'm a radio show host. They know I was in the Air Force. They know I'm an Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. They know I, went, I come here to William Patterson University. They know that um, I'm at St. Luke Baptist Church. They know, I mean, they know that their principal is more than just their principal. And That's so I it, love it. it, right. It gives them an hour like, Oh wow. There's a, there's a whole lot more to him than just, and, but it also gives me credibility to say, now, look, I'm not telling you what I think. I'm telling you what I know. I'm telling you, you know, in terms of we're saying this for a reason. And like you said earlier, cause they don't, cause this is funny. Some of the things you said is exactly the experiences and conversations I have with, with the kids. Cause I have elementary and middle school, like at grades three to eight. So it depends. If every now and again, I might have an eight-year-old in my office or a 10-year-old, or either I might have a 14 or 15-year-old. Mm-hmm. However, I will share it. I said, I know you're going to find this hard to believe, but Mr. Medley was eight at one point. <laughs> I know you're going to find this hard to believe, but Mr. Medley at some point in his life was 12 years old. He did not come out of his mother's womb at 60. So what you call, they'll look, and they'll look, it's like, it's like, in other words, I have been exactly where you are at some point a long time ago. Again, they kind of like never thought about this just any other. So, you know, from that point on, it's like, I understand what you're going through. I understand, you know, it's a lot different now with everything else, the technology and social media. and stuff. I get it. Mm-hmm. However, all the adults in the building, no one is telling you anything to hurt you. That everything we're telling you is to help you. Mm-hmm. And so we have like, we get into all those conversations again about, you know, okay, you know, I can, when I was your age, this happened to me. And we get into those type of dialogues. And so it, it creates a different type of relationship. And like I said, with you, like with poetry and all that, you could do, okay, let me ask you this, which I'm quite sure they do. But do you have your students in your class write poems? Oh, I do. I, I thought, do. I figured, I said, I know they <laughs> students like, oh, we have to write a poem. Oh, my goodness. But then after we start actually getting in the process of writing it, a lot of times they end up enjoying it. For example, um, one of the things I'm going to have my AP African American Studies course do is uh, we're coming toward the end of our first unit on ancient Africa, and so I'm going to ask them to write an abecedarian poem where they kind of sum up what they learned about the history of ancient Africa in this abecedarian poem. Oh, now, I love that. (laughs) <laughs> about, oh that's the other thing in my school on any given day i'll come in there with a dashigi on like i was in a dashigi <laughs> yesterday on any given matter of fact when we met at the festival i had on a dashigi on any that's given right. day 
that I'm either in a suit, the school uniform, or a dashiki. Those are the three attire I will come in there. Uh, and on any given day, like I said, it'll be their dashiki. <laughs> Uh, and so I go in there with all my Africanness, just just proud black man. They just, I mean, but again, the school is predominantly African American, Hispanic mm-hmm. population. Matter of fact, yeah. for Hispanic Heritage Month, my school they like we have we break the boys into what we call houses, and he, each house is named, and the boys named it like it was named by some eighth graders some years ago. But the houses they keep the same name, just different kids come in them. So one house is like Ali House, we have X House, we have Mandela House, we have Chavez House, we have Latimer House, and there's one of them in six houses all together. And, oh, I love it. and each one has a slogan like Ali Houses float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. X House is by any means necessary. Uh, Mandela House is who are you not to be great? I mean, each one has their, and they have to call, like if they're in that house, they better know that. But anyway, where I'm going with this is for Hispanic Heritage Month, each house had to look up a Hispanic country and do a presentation on it. They did it yesterday. They did their presentations yesterday. Now, the houses are across grade level. So it's made up from grades three to eight in comparison with them just sitting in their grade level. Mm-hmm. So they work as teams, their houses, but they had to present. We had, we had Colombia, we had Mexico, we had Peru. We had, I mean, and they, and they got a chance to pick. Like, we're not going to tell you what country to pick. You're going to pick your own country and you're going to research it. And they got up there and did their PowerPoint slides and they talked fun facts about their countries. And it was very nice. I mean, they're they're like third to eighth graders. So for a third to eighth grader to have to get up and present, and I I said, listen, you need to understand this. You're going to be doing this the rest of your academic career. Mm -hmm. High school, college, you're going to be working in teams to make presentations. Get to work, get to your career. You're going to be... So the more we can expose them to that's why I say I love the fact that you haven't written a poetry about that. Yes. Research it. Yeah. You've you've studied it. Now write, express yourself about it. Yeah, I, I think um, we need to show our young people that poetry is not some arcane, abstract, artistic form. It's it's something that's accessible to to people um, of all kinds of, of stripes. And so um, I love what what you're doing with with your your school. So many of my students don't like to get up and speak publicly, and I wish they had had more exposure to it when they were younger so that they could build up their confidence. But um, with that being said, I tell my students all the time, that's okay, you know, it's, it's, all, it's all right to feel shy, but I'm going to make you speak. Absolutely. Because this is the thing, and I, I teach public speaking at the college level, and it's always fascinating to me when somebody says, and they mean that. They don't. They mean it literally, not figuratively. <laughs> I would rather die than to speak in front of people. I'm like, are you kidding me? You'd you'd rather <laughs> die literally? They, yeah, than speak in front of people. And like for me, it's like you could put me in the middle of Yankee Stadium and it's totally packed, and you put me in the middle, I have no problem speaking there. But for mm-hmm. the, for most folks, for the average person, it's like, oh no, oh, no, I'm not speaking. Mm-hmm. So, and matter it's to the point now where colleges have made public speaking a mandatory course. It, it yeah, used to, that's important. It it's is. one of people's biggest fears. So yes. And I, I think it's just like this innate thing that we don't like to be embarrassed. And so a lot of people try to avoid things that will put us in a position to be embarrassed. But if you don't take risks, then how will you ever achieve greatness? That's absolutely right. And by the way, my school is an all-boys school. It's a single-gender school. It's an all-boys school. Uh, it's a leadership school. It's not alternative. It's not bad boy school. It's a leadership school. So that's why a lot of the things that you hear me describe, and we, we get a chance to be a little bit different than some of the schools in the district. Mm-hmm. Um, but like you were talking about, because like, like, there was one child in one of the houses that didn't get up when their house presented. He sat. He didn't get up. We thought he was absent. We said, where is Sutton? Is, is he absent? He's sitting out there, wouldn't go. And I mean, he didn't go. Now, later on in the afternoon, he out there on the basketball court, just going to town. I said, well, mm. how is it you can come out here and publicly and in front of other people do what you're doing out here on this basketball court, but you wouldn't get up there with your house to help present? So he just looks at me and goes, nope, 
never. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, oh, you will. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it is interesting. I was like, because you could be just as much embarrassed, missing shots and not being able to play well and so forth and mm-hmm. so on. But they don't do that. That's the kind of stuff. We try to help them connect those kind of dots. But again, poetry, and it's funny in terms of like, I've had poets as guests over the years. I've had male poets. I've had males who wrote poetry books. And now we get into like the dynamics of gender. Like, okay, you know, and I ask him, I said, well, you know, your poetry book, you write, you know, aren't, do you ever feel as if, you know, you're going to be seen as soft or considered soft or either not manly enough or not being able to get one? So he says, brother, let me tell you something. If you're a man who's able to write poetry, you have all the women you want. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, and it's it's always, um, you know, as as a woman, I love to see a man who can be um, vulnerable on the page. And so, yeah, there's some truth to that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I'm so glad that you're having that conversation with your young men because, um, you know, it's it's still. I think, you know, society's come a long way, but it's still really hard for men to be encouraged to have high emotional intelligence, to be vulnerable. Um, You know, the patriarchy has really done a number on us thinking that men can't be vulnerable, and if they are, then they're weak. No, you're right. You're you're absolutely right. To be vulnerable, whether you're, you know, a man or a woman. That's true. I like the way you said that vulnerable on the page. I like that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> to be vulnerable yeah. on a page. I know yeah, that's right. When you write poetry and you're, you're you know, expressing what's in your, your heart and soul, you know, it is always a risk that someone can look at it and say that it's not good enough or, um, you know, otherwise ridicule it. But, um, you know, that's a brave thing to do. And it's important for, for men to see how, vital it is that they be able to express themselves. I, I used to say, you know, if God didn't want men to cry, he wouldn't give them tear ducts. Absolutely right. And see, the and, other thing, you know, like... Crying is a release. It's, it, it's not a sign of weakness. It's let, just releasing the negative emotions so that you can move forward. Absolutely. My, my ELA teacher, last year, whenever she was teaching the poetry section, she used Tupac Shakur's song, Dear Mama. Oh, yes. That's what she used as that's how she taught poetry was a dear mama. Mm -hmm. And I always got a kick out of that first line because I'm not a fan of standardized tests. I'm not I'm not saying the kids don't need to be tested. I'm just not a fan of standardized tests and how we use them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I said, I would love to put Tupac's first line on a standardized test where it says, when I was young, me and mama had beef. I would love mm-hmm. to put that on the standard and then and say, you know, in Tupac's first line of when I was young, me and mama had beef. What does the word beef mean? <laughs> what, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I would love to give like an option, you know, like multiple choice. And I'll bet many in a different community would have no idea. They would say meat, steak, dinner. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that's an important lesson. So students understand that words have multiple meanings. Correct. That is, and it, it is also it, it also is a way to validate the beauty of African American vernacular. Yes, yes, that's absolutely right. So yeah, that's because you know it's a beautiful thing what our people have been able to do with this language that was forced upon us hundreds correct. of years ago. We we've brought a beauty to it that just can't be replicated. That is correct. And and again, that's why, again, when you have all this, like, because that's the other thing, the boys, the boys, well, they have come to realize it over time, but that's what rap is poetry. Yes. That's what hip hop, that's what rap, all of that's really poetry. Yes. And, and, and it's part of our culture that goes centuries back, back to the grills of West Africa. Correct. So in terms of your books, are you... Did you go through publishing house or did you self-publish or how, you know, how did your, your publishing or your books come into being? So I went to self uh, publishing route um, <clears throat> at first. So I, I always tell this story. 
um, after my father passed away at, at my um, my father's funeral, my, my cousin Alice came and she gave me a copy of her book that she had self-published. It's called Up Close and Personal. And so, um, you know, I put it on my bookshelf and one day, um, you know, sometime later I was cleaning and I uh, saw the book and I was like, oh, and I sat down and I started reading and I was like, you know, this is really great and, you know, maybe I should do something like this. And so... I started uh, going through notebooks and gathering all these poems. And um, in 2008, I found um, a self-publishing um, company called Wasteland Press. And so I had them publish my first book, Nat Feathers and Butterfly Wings. And so um, during the pandemic, um, someone tagged me with this um, uh, online poetry course. And so I, I attended... And the man that was running it said that he was going to start his own publishing company, a young African-American man, and it's called 2i Publishing. And so I had a manuscript that I wanted him to publish, and I submitted it, and he published it. It's called Stardust and Skin. And so sometime later, I expressed to him that I wanted to have all of my books uh, published under his company, and so he republished them for me. So now I've been published by... um, a small press. So now I'm official. <laughs> all right now. So in terms of somebody out there, because did you, all right, did you ever, this is going back to the beginning, then, did you ever envision yourself or thought that you would be an author or said, or said you know what, I'm going to write a book one day? Well, when I was 10, um, I tried to write a book and uh, I had my, my father's old typewriter and I was just sitting there typing away and eventually I gave up on it because it was harder than I thought it was going to be. But I, I did have that, that thought that, you know, one day I might like to write a book because of how much I like to read. So, um, so yeah, I, I didn't envision myself becoming a published poet necessarily, but um, this has been a really interesting journey, and I'm so glad that I'm on it. You know, it's interesting you made that connection between the reading and the writing, because generally, and that's what this, this show came about because the station manager at the time was looking for somebody to host a show, on books and reading. Mm. It's going back 23 years ago now and back in 2001. And the bulk of my guests who are authors were very good readers or loved reading. Every mm-hmm. now and again, I might come across one and say, no, I really didn't like reading. But most of the time, there was a connection between the reading and the writing. For yeah. those out there who might be listening, who may be teeter-tottering on if they want to write a book or not or how to go about it. What are some advice or thoughts you would give to them? Well, I mean, I've heard this advice often and it bears repeating. You have to be a reader. You, you just have to really study the craft of writing. You want to be able to express your ideas clearly and it really helps to, you know, have writing mentors, people that you study and, um, figure out how to create imagery and, and, and characters and really envelop your reader in the story. You really need to spend a lot of time reading all kinds of things to really develop that craft. And so, you know, don't just get stuck in one genre. Like, venture out, read mysteries, read thrillers, read poetry, read uh, memoirs, read historical fiction. You should read all kinds of things. Agreed. Because there, there is a connection between the reading and the writing, no question. And see, again, do you, in terms of knowing what you know and doing what you do, going back to your students again, do you ever have, like, as they did their writing and their poetry, did you kind of put them up as if they were at a spoken word or had them do anything along those lines? I mean, because it's like I constantly have to t- help them understand after a poem is read, you don't clap your hands, you snap your fingers. Uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Do, do, do you kind of yeah, put I them in? Do that too. Oh, good. So, so again, I just think it's great that they have somebody who's doing it living in front of them. I think that is so important to have a model. Like, not only are you telling them, but you're actually doing it. <laughs> yeah, um, I, and I try to tell my students, I'm not asking you to do anything that I haven't done or right. that I'm not willing to do. And so... Um, I I do try to um, model for them and give them mentor text whenever I can so they can see what good writing looks like and 
they can build confidence in being able to do it themselves. Now, from the social justice piece, how important, and I know the answer, this is, this is one of those I'm being like a lawyer, I know the answer to it before I ask the question, but <laughs> <laughs> how, is, how important it is, how important is it, particularly since you're dealing with students, for black and brown students to get this whole notion of reading and writing? Mm. Yeah. Well, they need to know that reading and writing can change the world. Correct. You know, um, social justice movements, how many of them have been fueled by reading and writing? And, and see, again, because the reading, right, then you had the speaking piece, because you were talking about the movements and everything. In the movements, people got to be able to speak. They got to be able to express themselves and get their points across. But all mm-hmm. these are skills that, like I said, we have them. People always try to act as if we don't, try to make us believe that we don't, but we do. And, and again, we're some of those, because going back to, we were talking about the men with the, I journaled for years. I have like a suitcase, like 20 or 30 journals that are locked away. And mm-hmm. um, I, you know, because again, and, and Earth and I talked about this last week. When you journal, the journal is for you. That's not necessarily for anybody else to see. As a matter of fact, they should not even be thinking about going because that's like a breach in privacy. Yes. If you know that's somebody's journal, you don't go in that because that's, <laughs> you ought to know it's private, even though you have folks who will go in there anyway. But you ought to know it's private. But again, it's, it's, they're wonderful skills to have. Yes, absolutely. And they need to know that um, our people have a long history of expressing powerful thoughts in, in writing and in and, and, and speech. I designed a, a course called Afro-Latino American Voices at my previous school. And I, I showed them things from Nina Simone. And, All right now. Um, uh, the Young Lords and Gil Scott Heron, um, Billy Holiday, where they would um, express themselves about social justice issues. And so they need to know that this is not anything new, that our people have been doing it since we've been brought to the Western Hemisphere, and they have the ability to do it too, and they should be expressing themselves about um, issues that are, are of importance to, to us. You know what? I'm glad you said that because... Through music, lyrics, and poetry, messages can be sent and are sent. Yes, and some of the messaging that our young people are, are getting is just really problematic. And they need to know that um, rap music at, at one point, especially in you know, the late 80s, early 90s, was really inspiring a lot yes. of young people to get to know their history. And that movement was usurped by corporate forces, and they started promoting things that, you know, talked about drugs and um, promiscuity and things that are not healthy behaviors. Correct. And see, now you... That was intentional. Yes, indeed. Systemic. Yes. Intentional is absolutely right, because now you started uh, financing and, and producing folks who are giving messages that are against your own folks. Right. And, and what they, unfortunately for a kid, they're not going to realize you need to understand, you know, who's actually supporting and paying for that and what messages they're paying for. Because you're again, um, I'm trying to think that same language arts teacher that I was telling you about that this past year did poetry with Tupac year before last, she taught a lesson on the message. Yes. And it was what she had to do. What she had to, the boys do was, all right, I want you to read the lyrics to the message. And this was done back in 1983, 84, somewhere around there and put it up against because at that time it was 2022. Put it up against the times in 2022, 2023. And it was amazing. Not much has changed. Yeah. You're absolutely right. If you look at the words in the message. Mm hmm. A lot of the same things are going on today, and that's when the boy and the boys had a chance to to come come across that realization for themselves. Like, oh wow, like, yeah, this is going back to like 1984, 1983, 1982, somewhere around that time frame, and now this is 40 plus years later, and yet we could, for the most part, sing the same lyrics. 
Yeah, I did a similar lesson with uh, Gil Scott Heron's uh, Why Do You on the Moon? Yes. And, you know, <laughs> some of the same struggles in terms of, you know, so many people live in impoverished conditions, but then governments find money to go to the moon and um, do other things that might have some importance, but there are more pressing needs here on Earth. Correct. So, yeah, it, they need to know that um, change is slow. Um, power can seize nothing without a demand. And, um, you know, this is not an old struggle. I mean, this is an old struggle. This is nothing new. Correct. And, you know, people need to keep speaking out about it and, and trying to make change. So I see you went to an HBCU. Do you ever get a chance to tie that in? You went down to spout. If I was doing college all over again, if I was a teenager, I would go to Morehouse. Because it, <laughs> it's going back during the time whenever I was applying to colleges as a kid, didn't know much about college, just that and the other. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if I knew what I knew now, I'd have gone to Morehouse. I, I know that whole area, that whole Atlanta Clark, the, oh, you know, yes. Spelman, Morehouse. I know that whole area well. Yeah, you wanted to go to the house, huh? <laughs> That's right. Matter of <laughs> fact, I got the house hoodie. I got the house yeah, cap. The house was the house, and so was the yard. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's interesting. When I was in high school, I actually wanted to go to Wesleyan University in Connecticut. Okay. That was my dream school. I, and I, I didn't get in, unfortunately. Um, I, I did apply to, to Spelman um, and Howard, and I got into both of those schools. And at first, I was a little disappointed. I was like, oh, I really wanted to go to Wesleyan. But I went down to Spelman for the Accepted Students Weekend and just fell in love with the campus. And I'm so glad that I went to Spelman. I learned so much about um, my field of study, uh, about my own history as as an African-American, as a woman. Um, and we were really encouraged to be leaders in our own right. And um, yeah, it was just an incredible experience. And I wish... I had done things differently as Spelman. When I went, I was pretty shy, and I didn't socialize as much as I wish I had. Um, but n- nevertheless, it was a wonderful experience. I had fantastic professors, and it was just really interesting to see a black intelligentsia. That's so important. It, it's, they, were, they were mentors to us, and so um, I'm so glad I went to Spelman. I know that's right, but see, and then I also see you got NYU on there. You got New York University. Yes, sir. That I got my first master's degree, uh, social studies education, from uh, NYU before I started teaching. So I, I started. I was a social studies teacher, actually. Oh, okay. My, so my undergraduate major was in political science. I initially wanted to be an attorney. Ah, uh-huh. see, see, all of that to me is like brings so much value into the classroom. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and it's funny, even though I, I ended up not studying law, a number of things that I learned as I was studying political science, they make their way into my English instruction. Oh, I absolutely. I was disciplinary approach to teaching English. That's what, see, and to me, all right, and I'm not taking anything away from anybody who's just an English major or a teacher major or whatever. I'm not, I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. All I'm saying is it's so much more of a richer experience because of the experiences. You can talk about things that somebody that who didn't major in that wouldn't know. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's, that's why, I mean, I, I came in alternate route. And like I said, there's, I pull on, in my mind, there's no such thing as a wasted experience. There's no such yes. thing as a wasted that everything at some point connects. Mm-hmm. So everything that we've ever done, you can now pull into a lesson uh like last week was and i didn't know such a day existed but it was national custodian appreciation day and i years ago back in 19 from 1979 to 1985 i was a custodian so i knew what it felt like to be a custodian i knew the how people view you, how people look down on you, how people mm-hmm. accuse you of stealing anything, get missing in the building. It was a custodian who took it. I knew all of that. So when that whole thing came up on my calendar about National Custodian Appreciation Day, I made a big deal about it. I called the custodians down and made a speech to the school and really gave them their props and highlighted them. And she, the custodians, they were so appreciative. But again, had I not 
because I've been a custodian, I've been a secretary, I've been in those positions, so I have an, an affinity for those in the school. Matter of fact, I even shared a story about um, in one of the buildings that I was adjunct professor in, I wouldn't have keys to the door. I'd come in in the evening ready to teach my course, the door would be locked. So I'd grab the custodian of his name was Kenny. It was an African American custodian, his name was Kenny. And I'd mm-hmm. said, um, Excuse me, could you? Open the door, you know, the door is locked. And he pulled me to the side and he says, you know, for you, I'll do it because you treat me like a human being. Mm, he said, but there are yeah. some in here who, when they ask me, I tell them, no, I'm sorry, I don't have that key. You know, it's, it's interesting. Um, when I first started teaching, um, I learned very early on that some of the people that you show ultimate respect for payroll secretary. Correct. And the custodian. Correct. <laughs> Every school that I worked in, the, the custodians always liked me because I went out of my way to keep my classroom clean. Correct. I, I didn't like it when students uh, would litter because I'm like, you know, that's disrespectful to the custodian. That's making, right. Um, their job more, more difficult. And, you know, it, it's a matter of showing respect to people. I, I respect, um, the New York City uh, sanitation. Correct. Because without them, <laughs> can you correct? I mean, it's like evidence? that's after every job is important. That's and, right. And going along, like you were talking about the sanitation man, I told him that same day when I was giving the speech about the custodians, I said, "You ever notice the sanitation folks never strike in the summer? No, you never strike in the winter. So you ever mm. notice that they never strike in the winter? So they looked. I said, because see, in the winter, yeah, try, it'll look bad." You know, it, it'll be annoying, uh, but you don't get the smell. In the summer, when it's hot, you get the yes. smell. I said, so anytime they strike, they always strike in the summer. They never strike in the winter because they uh, know absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's just it. We need to... Um we need to put forth the idea that there's dignity in all work. Exactly. And everyone is deserving of respect no matter what their station in life. That's exactly right. Now, going back to your poetry, and this is a question because I've released two musical CDs. And oftentimes yeah. people will say, what's your favorite out of all your songs? Like, it's like between the two CDs is like 22 instrumental jazz songs. And people will say, what's your favorite? And that's really hard for me to answer, only because yeah. I love all of them. But I'm about to ask you the same question. Out of all your poems, are very, do you have a favorite? A favorite poem? Yes. I like all your different writings. Is there anyone in particular that's like your favorite that you've written? And oh, if you, man, that's hard. Yeah, it is. That's <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny. When, a lot of times when I bend, um, people will ask me which of my books is my favorite. And I'm always like, I don't know. I, I can't answer that question. Um, well, okay. So I guess one of my favorite poems is my poem called The Anti Room. That might be one of my favorites. Okay. Okay. Because see, yeah, that, that's kind of like the way, like I have two. One is called What Could Have Been. The other one's called Respect Your Father. Those two mm. probably would be my favorite. Out of the 22 or 23, because I love all of them. I mean, I remember in the movie about Adam Clayton Powell Jr., mm. they asked him out of all his legislative accomplishments and this, that, and the other, they asked him that question, which one is your favorite? And he says, again, I said, that's just like asking me to ask which one is my favorite children. I said, you can't, right. <laughs> like, you, yeah. you, you can't answer that. But, you know, there may be some you you have an affinity for more than others. By chance, do you have any of your books near you and you want to read a poem on the air? I sure do. All right, because I always love for the audience to hear the author read because you can put in your inflections and the emphasis where somebody else reading it may not put the inflections and the emphasis there. So I always love for the author to read something. So if you have something, feel free. I'm going to open up, you know, and I'll give you the finger snaps whenever you're done. Okay. (laughs) All right, well, you know what? I'll go ahead and share the ante room. It's a poem that appeared in my first book, Nat Feathers and Butterfly Wings. This is how it goes. Baby, I must tell you, I can't be the type to eat a plum or a peach or an apple before it's ripe. Though you desire my dainty meats, a pure heart and motive is what I seek. Love is more than honey lickings, strawberry cream and apple and size. 
I do want you, but caress my thoughts before my thighs. Follow my aspirations. My breasts won't disappear. The small of my back can wait. Ned my doubts and fears. Explore my world. Then take me to heaven. Now, listening audience, you know when I've had poets on before, that sound was not clapping hands. That was snapping fingers. Because when you go to spoken word or when you go to a poetry reading, we don't clap our hands. We snap our fingers. Oh, I loved it. See, that's what I'm talking about with the intonation, the sound, the emphasis. So you can, like somebody just reading that may not in their head hear it that way. That's why I love to hear the author read it because you can put the passion into it. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. <laughs> Do you have yeah, another? That was a poem that I, I started in college, and okay. I finished it when I was in my 30s. Okay. All right. All right. Well, we are getting near the end of our hour. What I usually do for the last five minutes or so, four or five minutes or so, is I shut the mic off, and you have the opportunity to promote or shout people out. And uh, th- During that time, you can say anything with the exception of a dollar amount. But as far as websites and names of the company and what you offer, what people can buy, what you, you know, like, for example, in your sweet as a simile, whatever that specialty apparel is, you can talk about anything with the exception of a dollar amount. <laughs> but this is your because at that point, when they get in touch with you, you, you all do that. But uh, anything short of a dollar amount, I'm going to turn the mic off and you have the opportunity to promote, promote, promote. All right. Well, thank you. All right, so if you liked what you heard with my poem, The Ante Room, I have uh, a number of books for sale, uh, Nat Feathers and Butterfly Wings, $30 in a Bowl of Soup, Honeysuckle Me, These Pearls Are Real, Stardust and Skin, May He Bless My Name. All of those titles are available through 2i Publishing, and you can get them through uh, BarnesandNoble.com, Amazon.com, And you can also order them through uh, Bronx Bound Books and the Lit Bar. Um, I also have a couple of chapbooks. One of them is called Clap Your Hands, Stomp Your Feet through Grandma Moses Press. And my last chapbook is called Sundays and Hot Butter Rolls, A Granddaughter of Harlem Speaks. And that is available through Finishing Line Press. So... The apparel that I have, um, I'm able to sell them through um, various uh, book festivals and things like that, and all of them promote um, positive messages, and um, one of my poems is on the T-shirts and hoodies. So you can go to my website, you can look me up, Carla M. Cherry, and you can um, look into the things that I have available there. So what I'd like to do now is share a couple more poems, if that's okay. Sure, by all means, go go forth. Okay. So this poem is called Grand, and it's from my book, Stardust and Skin. Grand. Seated by the entrance to our sister circle, a wide white wrap around her head, her dark brown locks flowing outward, wearing a white cotton A-line dress, white shoes. Our facilitator instructs, take this white paper, write down something you need to heal in your wounds, and fold it. We write in silence. I record the names of my regrets. You will walk over to the small table in the center of our circle, place that wound into the glass container filled with water, and as each of you does so, say, Ashe. What is what all of you hear? One by one, we declare a need for inner peace, healing from a breakup, dispose of negative energy, forgiveness, resurrection of creativity. I wasn't going to come except for this sister, a woman says, gesturing to her right. My daughter died a few months ago. My other daughter is in the hospital. I am angry. I am sad. I have trouble getting out of bed, and I feel bad because my sick daughter needs me. I don't know what to do. You are so strong, I say. I lost my sister before last Thanksgiving. My mother has the same anger and sadness that you do. You're doing the best you can. 
Don't be afraid to ask for help. Heads nod, tissues pass, cheeks are wiped because we know our shawl of sympathetic words and tears may not do much to cure for warm and will not rush grief along. Before you go, the leader says, reach inside your white gift bags. We each pull out the stone from its tiny white canvas bag. The stone was white. It's a moonstone, she says. Choose a goal. I want to keep writing. We embrace each other, exchange names once more, drink fresh squeezed apple juice with wheatgrass, and one by one, plant Harlem pavement with halcyon feet. And I heard it, and one of the words was ashe. So I'm saying ashe, ashe, ashe. Well, thank you so much. That was a poem about a, a healing ceremony that I took uh, part in with, with a group of women in Harlem. And, you know, I, I write about it because it's important that we engage in self-care, that we seek to heal the pain that we suffer from. And, you know... I think it's important that we connect as human beings. And so I wanted to share that poem so that people, you know, can see that that's something that I've done and it's something that all of us should do. Absolutely. Now, is that what, do you have another one you want? Because you said a couple, or is that the one? Well, I do have one more. Okay. And this one is called Psalm 5 for Black Boys, and it's from my book, May He Bless My Name, which is a book that I wrote about my motherhood journey. Psalm 5 for Black Boys. But let all black boys take refuge in you. Let the confounding black boys, the nerdy black boys, bookish black boys, playful black boys, boisterous black boys, shy and quiet black boys, athletic black boys, tech-savvy black boys, empathetic black boys, the righteous black boys, the spiritual black boys, the rebellious black boys, the searching black boys, poetic black boys, truth-telling black boys, prophetic black boys. Sing and shout, rejoice in you. Surely, Lord, you will bless them and keep them. Surround them with your favor, armor, and shield. I might have to get a copy of that one to hang in my school because I told you my book, my school is an all boys school. <laughs> well, like I said, it's in my book. May he bless my name. So, all right now. Well, Carla, I thank you so much for rising early to join me. It totally enjoyed the discussion. I record the show. It will be up on my YouTube channel sometime in the next few days. I still have to get the one from last week up with Eartha. But I will send you a copy of the links when I get done with that. And once you receive them, you are free to do anything you'd like with them. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate our conversation today, and I'm looking forward to uh, checking out the recording. All right. Well, I wish you nothing but the best. And again, thank you so much for sharing this time with me. And thank you for sharing your time with me. All right. Take care now.